uh, I'm Lily Alderson. I am a first year PhD student at the University of Bristol, where I study the atmospheres of exoplanets. And today I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of what I think are some of the strangest skies in our galaxy, and hopefully tell you about how astronomers like myself study the atmospheres of exoplanets and different celestial bodies. So to get started, I want you to think about what the Earth's sky looks like on a typical day. Maybe you're thinking of blue skies, probably more likely clouds, it's certainly not sunny here today, but all around probably not that interesting. Well, I'd argue that that's not always true. So take, for example, when particles caused by air pollution or wildfires, like in this image of San Francisco in 2020, get into our atmosphere um, and interact with the light, they produce these kind of apocalyptic like hazes and speak these very dark orange skies as the light gets blocked. We also have giant storm clouds that we call supercells, and these help to form tornadoes. And so you can see um, a really small one right in the um, bottom right of this image um, from Colorado in 2015. And of course, we all know that climate change is helping to drive the increase in extreme weather in our atmosphere, and that it helps to produce really intense hurricanes and hurricane seasons like last year, where we had 30 named storms in the North Atlantic, which is the most we've ever seen. And at one point, you could see six different storms all at the same time. And of course, we also have the Northern Lights, um, or the Aurora Borealis which occur when high energy particles from the sun interact with the upper layers of our atmosphere and produce this really dazzling light show. So I would argue that Earth skies can be really interesting and have a huge variety all by themselves. But what about all the other planets? Let's start with Venus. So this is the surface of Venus as seen by the Soviet Venera 13 probe. Now Venus has thick clouds made up of sulfuric acid and they block out much of the sunlight and give off this yellowish sulfur glow that you can see. And Venus's atmosphere is so inhospitable that when Venera 13 landed, it only survived for two hours before the atmosphere killed it. Next up, we have Mars. Now, Mars's atmosphere, thankfully, doesn't kill our rovers quite so easily, but its atmosphere is 100 times thinner than Earth's is. Mars's atmosphere also features dust devils, and you can see one moving across this image here, which was taken by NASA's Spirit Rover in 2005. And dust devils are brief torrents of wind that pick up dust from the surface um, and last for a few minutes at a time, drifting across Mars's surface. Now, perhaps the most iconic atmosphere in the solar system is Jupiter. And this is a time lapse of images taken by the Voyager spacecraft as it approached Jupiter. And so you can see here the motion of the atmospheric bands as they move across um, the planet. And you can also see Jupiter's giant red spot, which is swirling um, down near the bottom of the image. And that's a giant storm which has been raging on Jupiter for hundreds of years now. And Jupiter isn't the only planet that has giant storms. Saturn um, also has its fair share of really big storms. And this really bright red one here um, is seen at the very north pole of Saturn. Um, and has also been swelling for a really, really long time. But it's not just the planets in our solar system that have atmosphere. Titan, which is Saturn's largest moon, has a really thick atmosphere, kind of similar to Venus, but instead of being full of acidic cloud, Titan is full of hydrocarbons like methane. And so this thick orange haze that you can see deep in the atmosphere here is made up of what we call pholins. And they're kind of like a thick, gunky residue sort of like tar that gets left behind when high energy particles like photons or cosmic rays hit and interact with Titan's atmosphere. But there are more planets than just the ones in our solar system. So the universe is full of exoplanets, which are planets which orbit around stars other than the sun. And so you, if you've looked up at a star in the sky, there's a really good chance that that star has planets going around it, just like our sun does. And they're found all across the universe in all sorts of different sizes and shapes. And so you can see here, this is a plot of exoplanet masses against um, orbital separation of exoplanets, so how far away they are from their host stars. Um, and so you can see from this plot, we found a lot of exoplanets. The first exoplanets were found in the 1990s, and 
as of right now, we've found over 4,424 confirmed planets. And so as you can see from this plot, we've got the solar system planets on here as well to just help give you a bit of a reference. We've got lots of things that sort of look similar to Jupiter, big puffy gas things. Um, we've got lots of terrestrial rocky planets. We've got things that look like the ice giants. We've got a strange class of things in between rocky planets and ice giants, and we call those normally sub-Neptunes because they're smaller than Neptune. And we also have this class of planets up here that aren't really anything like what we've seen in the solar system. And we call those hot Jupiters because they're like Jupiter, but they're really, really close to their star. But unfortunately, unlike the solar system planets, exoplanets are much, much harder for us to study. And while we've been able to, spend, to send many, many missions to explore the solar system, and you can see them all charted out in this diagram here, and some of our missions have managed to get pretty far away from the sun. The furthest man-made object from the sun right now is Voyager 1, which is 153 times further away from the sun than Earth is, or 153 AU away. Exoplanets are just too far for us to be able to send probes or rovers. The nearest exoplanet is four light years away, which is 250,000 AU away. So we just can't send a mission to an exoplanet to study it close up. So how can we study them? So imagine that you have an exoplanet orbiting around its star. Well, every time the planet passes or transits, as we say, in front of its star, it'll block a little bit of the light that's coming from the star. And it makes a graph that looks like this. So you get a bit of a dip in the light every time the planet passes in front. And the bigger the planet is, the more light that gets blocked or a deeper transit depth happens. But if that planet has an atmosphere, some of the starlight will pass through the atmosphere and something interesting starts to happen. When you look at the star in different colors, you'll see that the planet appears to have a different radius and blocks more of the light at some colors than others. And so what's happening here is that different features in the atmosphere at different wavelengths block different amount of light. And so if we can build up lots of different wavelengths, we can get an idea of the different things in the atmosphere that might be blocking the light. And if we observe the planet across our whole spectrum of light from UV to optical to infrared, and we measure how its radius changes, as you can see is happening here as we move through the um, spectrum of wavelengths, we can measure what's known as its transmission spectrum. And this allows us to detect all kinds of different features within the atmospheres of exoplanets. And so, for example, you get sharp features caused by atomic um, emission absorption, such as by sodium and potassium, which you can see in the optical here. You get larger bumps and wiggles caused by molecular features, such as um, water and carbon monoxide. And you also get scattering features, um, which uh, we see as kind of these strong slopes towards the UV and the blue end of the optical, and they get caused by um, scattering of light with things like H2. Now that's probably quite a lot to take in, and it's a little confusing when you hear it for the first time, so let me try and give you a visual example of what's actually happening here. So here we've got a normal picture of the Earth and the Moon, just as you would see with your eyes if you were up in space, maybe on the International Space Station. Now we're going to view the same image, but with a filter. And so now we're only seeing the light um, at 8.6 microns, so the specific wavelength. And you can see everything roughly looks the same as it did before. It's just in black and white because there's no color here. Now, if we view the same thing again, but in a different filter, so this time at 9.6 microns, we instead see this. And so what you might have noticed is that the Earth is a little bit bigger in this image than it was before, but the moon stayed exactly the same. So if we jump backwards and forwards, you can see the Earth seems to be getting bigger and smaller, but the moon isn't changing. And this is because Earth's atmosphere has a really strong ozone feature at 9.6 microns, whereas the moon doesn't. The moon has no atmosphere, so it has no ozone. And so this ozone feature makes the Earth, or the, makes the radius of Earth look bigger at this wavelength at 9.6 microns than it does at 8.6 microns. And so this is what we do 
when we try and study exoplanet atmospheres. We look for these tiny, tiny changes in radius um, caused by different features in different atmospheres and try and use that to help us understand what might be happening within those atmospheres. So what kind of weird and wonderful things have we seen on exoplanets so far? Let me start with HD 189733b, which was one of the first exoplanet atmospheres which was studied. So you may have noticed that in its uh, transmission spectrum here, it has this really long slope towards um, the bluer optical wavelengths. And this um, big blue slope makes the planet look really, really blue. We think that the slope is being caused by silicate clouds. So what does that mean for an average day on HD 189733b? So these clouds are made of liquid glass. That's the silicate in the atmosphere. And the planet has, also has really, really strong winds, up to seven times the speed of sound. And these winds whip these glass clouds, glass clouds um, all around the planet um, at supersonic speeds. Um, and when the glass gets cold enough to condense and rain, it causes the glass to rain sideways. Next up is WASP-12b, which is slightly less of a horror movie and slightly more glamorous, but certainly still not habitable. Now, WASP-12b has a slope all the way across its spectrum from the blue all the way out to the infrared. And this is caused by clouds of liquid rubies and sapphires, which scatter the light in all different directions within the atmosphere, creating this uniform slope all the way across its spectrum. Next up is maybe one of my favorite planets, WASP-107b. Now this planet's orbiting a star which gives off so much energy that it's caused the radius of the planet to get really, really big. So the planet has puffed up and so much so that the planet's density is the same as candy floss. So if you imagine candy floss is basically nothing. That's what this planet is like. It's so big that its density is really, really tiny. Now its spectrum has a really strong spike in the infrared caused by helium. But why is that? Well, the energy from the star is so strong that the helium in the atmosphere um, is getting lots of energy itself and is becoming really excited and is able to escape the atmosphere and run away from the atmosphere. And so it's kind of being blown away by the star. And so you can see as the planet moves around the star, we get this big tail, almost like a comet um, of helium that's escaping from the atmosphere. And it's so efficient, um, this helium escape within WASP-107b, that the planet is losing up to 4% of its mass every billion years. Now, the final planet that I want to tell you about is WASP-76b. Like many hot exoplanets, WASP-76b is tidally locked. And that means that one side of the planet is always facing the star in a permanent daytime, and the other side is in permanent nighttime. So kind of like the moon is one side of the planet is always facing the star at the same time. Now this means that because one side always gets um, the starlight and the other side doesn't, there's a really big temperature difference between the two sides of the planet. Now the day side of this planet is so hot, over 2000 degrees Celsius, that um, iron and other metals get vaporized. So it's so hot that iron can turn into a gas. And this iron gas gets carried through the atmosphere to the night side, where it's able to condense, cool down, and turn into a liquid and rain liquid iron on the night side of this planet, potentially looking something like this artist's impression. So hopefully I've managed to convince you that the galaxy is full of some pretty strange and mysterious skies, no matter how far away from home you look. Um, although hopefully that exoplanets are some of the coolest. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about exoplanets, atmospheres, and just about anything in between. So you talked a lot about uh, exoplanets that are pretty dangerous and uh, probably don't want to go and move to, but I think I was wondering, have we identified any that we might be able to go to, not necessarily that they're close enough, but have an atmosphere or conditions that people could visit without into the death? Well, that really depends on <laughs> your category or kind of how you describe um, like habitable. How, how, how easily habitable do you want something to be? Um, 
in short, if you ask me personally, I would say no, we haven't found anything habitable. Um, generally, astronomers defined um, habitable exoplanets as being um, far enough away from their stars that water is liquid, but not so far away that water is ice. So for example, on Earth, normally water is a liquid, so we have oceans. Um, and we have found several exoplanets that lie in this habitable zone. The problem is then, even if they're in this habitable zone, that doesn't mean that they even have atmospheres at all. Even if they do have an atmosphere, it doesn't mean that atmosphere is safe. For example, Venus is in um, the sun's habitable zone, but you wouldn't want to live on Venus. It would kill you. Definitely <laughs> so, not. Def you know, just because we have, we know of some planets that maybe could be in the habitable zone, so that doesn't mean we found any planets that will be habitable. And also, you know, that's habitable to what we think habitable could be. There could be other life in the universe that has a different category of habitable. So the answer at the moment is no, but who knows? <laughs> cool, thanks. How many planets do most stars have? Yeah, so again, we're not really sure. Um, the field of exoplanets is only about 20 years old, so we, we've only just kind of begun to study um, them in a really big picture way. Um, but our estimates, we probably think most stars have at least one planet, um, but it also sort of depends on the type of star. So you get stars range, you get very, very big, very hot stars that um, live fast and die young. Um, and you also have much smaller stars, um, which are less hot, um, but tend to be a bit more active. So they have these big solar flares. Um, and we think that possibly the stars that are um, slightly smaller seem to have more planets than the stars or are more likely to have planets than the much bigger stars. So probably around one, but it depends on what type of star you are. Okay, and is that because the more active stars are likely sort of like destroying them as they're doing what um, they're doing? This isn't really my area of expertise. The, That's okay. the more, so the really, the really tiny stars um, we call M dwarfs, and those ones actually are quite active. Um, and we, they seem to, they seem to have more stars. But it might be that we're just better at finding the stars around those planets because, if I remember, I said the a bigger planet blocks more light when it passes in front of the star. But equally, right. if the star is much smaller, then more light is being blocked. Um, so it might just be that we're much better at finding planets around small stars. Um, we need, I think we just need a bit more time, more time yeah. to study these planets. We haven't had long enough yet. I think that's fair enough. I mean, the fact that they've only started finding them sort of within my lifetime is, uh, you know, it shows we haven't really looked at it for very long at all. Thanks. No, definitely. That's great.